In this video, you'll be learning about this topic. No, I'm hearing you guys in Clubhouse and I'm just like, whoa, we need to have a chat with these two. And I mean, I've been, I've been following you guys for years now and this is exciting. So what I'm going to do to start this off, I just want to pitch a couple underhand pitches for you guys. I want you to crank them out of the ballpark so far that people can't even see the ball. It's going to be like the natural where the cover comes off the ball as you guys are hitting these, these two underhand pitches. The first one I got for you, China controls all the hashing power. Therefore, they can make Bitcoin do whatever they want. False. I mean, they don't <laughs> control all the, all the hashing power. Historically, they've controlled a, a significant amount, but that, that amount has been waning. And even though all that hashing power does exist within the borders of, of China, they can't really control the Bitcoin network at the end of the day. The Bitcoin network is controlled by full nodes who dictate the consensus rules and, and validate the consensus rules with those full nodes. And if the miners within China or anywhere in the world for that matter, uh, attempt to, to fall outside of those consensus rules, full nodes will reject the, the blocks or transactions that they attempt to include in those blocks. So in terms of being able to control Bitcoin via the mining industry in China, that is a bit of a stretch. I believe the worst that could happen, which is also a bit of a stretch, is, is all the new mining equipment within the borders could be turned off and slow down block production for some time. But that's why we have the difficulty adjustment. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Harry. I do. I want to reframe the question. A 51% attack in the Bitcoin network is not the same as a 51% attack on an election. This is not majority rule. This is not flip the party. This is not a deep change to the behavior of the network. What it would involve is a challenge to process and confirm net new blocks. There may be a very, very shallow reorg. Those are the kind of scope of the problems that could arise from that type of behavior. And exactly like Marty said, the network is unbelievably, unbelievably antiviral and white blood cell driven. And so what that means is that you've got tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people all over the planet with their eyes on the asset that Bitcoin delivers, which is the UTXO set. So the history of the fidelity of the transactions over the last 13 years has been driven to this tip of the blockchain, this point in time. That incredibly high fidelity transaction set across history is the asset that Bitcoin delivers. And right now it's delivering it to the tune of $975 billion in market cap. And so if we were to see something that was going to try to erode this historical value transfer, this transfer log. There are hundreds of thousands of people with all of their eyes on proper behavior and proper game theoretic design. And so if we begin to see or smell the, the first instance of this, which would emerge from a very, very small point in time, 51% attack, the ability for the network to route around that type of bad behavior is instantaneous. And the negative impact for the participants in an attack like that would be catastrophic economically and socially. And then even coordinating the individual miners within China to attempt a 51% attack like that would be logistically a nightmare, potentially impossible, especially when you consider the amount of miners that are doing stuff off grid. That's the one thing that is really ironic about the first 12, 13 years of Bitcoin is that some of the most capitalistic activities come from the, the mining industry within China. If you speak with some miners in China, you'll, you'll find that they, they're profit-driven as well, and they, they don't want any of this stuff to happen. And actually spoken to some that, that are looking to co-locate equipment in different geographical regions just to, to mitigate risk from the CCP. Their individuals running these businesses are, are pretty capitalistic. It's not like the CCP controls everything that's going on in the mining industry or anything for that matter, from what I can tell. I want to jump in on, on two more data points that are really important when you think about this mental model. One is that the largest Bitcoin mine in the world that I'm aware of is about 250 to 300 megawatts in size and represents somewhere between three and 5% of the network, depending on the rigs that they're running. So you need to have, if every farm in China was that size, you would need to get your hands on 15 to 20 of the largest. So what that really means when you look at sort of the power law across how large those farms really are, you need to find your way to get your hands on 50 to 100 different warehouses at the same time and get them all to behave in the same way. There's a massive coordination problem, assuming you can even locate. The second data point is, that, is exactly what Marty said. The migration of hash out of China over time by existing players 
is very, very rapid and they're very motivated. So if you're operating on any of those hydro facilities in China, there's significant seasonality. You're already moving hash in between locations. And so they're incentivized to avoid those switching costs to migrate to regions where there's stable access to power, which by and large is in, in Eastern Europe right now. I've heard of some South American migration among a couple of other locations. So the trend is moving actively away of the miners that are there currently, not to mention the net new hash that, that Marty and myself represent, among others, migrating elsewhere. And explain why they're moving elsewhere. Political risk. Exactly. It's power availability and political risk. So they do not live under a stable regulatory regime by any stretch. And they don't always have high uptime, high availability of power because you know, they're very beholden to the, to the wet and dry seasonality of China's hydro environment. What is the, because I know the current hashing is less than 50% there. What's the number that we're seeing today? And what was it five years ago? The, the most common stat that was thrown out, at least within the last three years, was 60%. Pretty sure that's waned to around 40% of, of recent estimates. It's been high, 80%, I would imagine at some point. Yeah, like if China was going to control the Bitcoin network, the best chance to do so was probably five or six years ago. Harry, you, you have any other comments on, on the amount that's there right now? Yeah, the estimates I've seen are, are similarly 40 to 60, 65%. And you know, we tend to think it's the lower end of that range because you know, even you'll see Bitmain pre-split and and I guess now they're Bitmain post-split, the Jihan for they've located hash in the US. They've got multiple facilities running in the US. And so even sort of the the crown jewel of the Chinese mining industry is locating hash in the US right now. So we've seen that progression over time happen. And like with anything, I think it's going to continue. I think that when you think about why hash wants to leave, it's about a regulatory regime that's uncertain in favor of a regulatory regime that's, that's at least more certain and legally is significantly more certain. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 